Hey everybody, welcome to The Mountain Gamer and welcome to this series of videos in which I will be doing a full playthrough of this war of mine, the board game. Now, if you know nothing about this game, um, it used to be a video game back in 2014. It was universally loved. It won over a hundred awards and that's because it um, dealt with war in a non-glorified fashion, okay? It was really about survival, uh, and you know d difficult situations and tough moral choices and it was as i said universally universally loved now the video game and the board game each take place uh during the siege of sarajevo and i'll have a little something about that in a few minutes but um yeah so both these games in both these games you are basically uh, playing a group of survivors in a destroyed house like a half standing house and you're scavenging for stuff you're trying to find water and food and all sorts of stuff you're trying to you're trying to improve the place where you live right you know, like maybe build a heater or a rainwater collector or different things like that in order to survive and every night you have to go outside the house and then scavenge for stuff you might meet people you might fight with people you might steal from people but you know you need to do that because you need food and water and medication and bandages and you know all that good stuff in order to survive and that is the point of the game survival during wartime during a certain number of rounds, uh, over the course of a certain number of rounds, and at the end, you know, if you're still alive, you win. Yeah. Uh, by the way, this was designed by the same uh, fine folks who made Frostpunk, if you are interested. Now, as I said, this is going to be a full playthrough, which means it is very long, but I did cut out all the boring bits, but I still want you to uh, understand my decisions and my headspace and what I, why I'm doing what I'm doing. This isn't like trying to do lightning fast or anything. I want you to play along with me to understand what I'm doing, you know? And if I fail and if I win and all that, at least you'll know what was going on in my head. That being said, I have put some timestamps all over the place, so if you wanna skip a certain phase, you can do that. I also wanna mention that I, I flagged um, a lot of the reality impacts. Now, reality impacts are cards that'll pop up every once in a while and they will instruct you to go read in this book, okay? There's uh, close to 2,000 entries in this book of scripts here, and this is all flavor. This is a lot of stories. Sometimes they're very short, sometimes they're longer, sometimes they ask you to do difficult choices. This is what elevates the game. Um, the video game did not have that. The video game, you just try to survive, and you know, yes, it was very moody and all that, but they didn't have a lot of, they didn't have these stories. And this, this changes everything. This basically takes a game that could be similar to Robinson Crusoe in the sense that you're trying to survive and the game kind of tries to beat you up, you know, <laughs> throughout the game. But then they infuse so much theme and it's just, it's, this, this thing is just amazing. Um, as I said before, this game takes place during the very real Siege of Sarajevo and I've prepared a little uh, something that you, you should watch right now. It's a minute long, but I think it sets the mood. Have a look. The siege of Sarajevo is the siege of the capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It is the longest siege of a capital city in the history of modern warfare. It lasted three years, ten months, and three and a half weeks. So close to four years, from 92 to 96. So in a nutshell, how did this happen? Well, when Bosnia and Herzegovina declared independence from Yugoslavia in 92, the Bosnian Serbs, whose strategic goal was to create a new Bosnian Serb state, decided to encircle Sarajevo with a siege force of 13,000 people. Now this was no ordinary military force. It was made up mostly of volunteers, paramilitaries and mercenaries, most of which held extremist beliefs. They assaulted the city with small arms, artillery and tanks. And before too long, they blockaded the city meaning that the city was cut off from the outside world. Now inside the city, the Bosnian government defense forces were poorly equipped and they were unable to break the siege. After four years, a total of 14,000 people were killed during the siege, including about 5,000 civilians. If you want to learn more about the conflict, I suggest at least checking out the Wikipedia page. It does actually go deep on the subject and uh, I do recommend it. So there you go, a uh, very serious theme, uh, very, very dire situations. If you can imagine being stuck in your own city, 
for four years while buildings are blowing up around you, while people are getting sniped just because they wanted a glass of water. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty horrible stuff. Now this is, like I said, it contains a lot of adult themes. It is very, very deep, but at the same time it is a game, okay? Let's not kid ourselves, you are rolling dice and stuff like that. And um, I was surprised at how much uh, hope and humanity and love there is in this thing. It's not all getting sniped in the face, okay? There's a lot of good stuff in there, a lot of stuff that tugs at your heartstrings in a good way. I don't know, I, I could ramble on, but this, this game is something very special. I wanna mention I was not sent a copy. This is my copy. I bought this game because I wanted to dig deep into it. I wanted to play it and I did and I love it. And I'm here to share it with you. So let's jump into this thing right now. This war of mine, the playthrough. Alright, so here we've got the board for this war of mine on the normal side of the game and as you can see, uh, the board doesn't even fit here on camera, it's so huge. There's a part at the bottom here too, I'm gonna try and get that, this is the storage. Uh, this is where you're gonna put all your tokens. And uh, yeah, this is the exploration space. We'll get to that later, but uh, I just wanted to show you the entirety of the board. But for now, let's focus on the house and um, all of the cards that you'll be kind of putting around it, all right? So I won't go too much into detail about how to set up the game because I think the instructions in, um, in this journal here are pretty clear on what you should be doing. But let's just add the decks here. So let's start from down here with the colors deck. These serve to um, randomize some events. And we've got the narrative actions. Those are basically goodies that we're gonna be uh, getting throughout the game. Next we've got the fate cards. And these, well, uh, determine your fate. <laughs> Next we've got the ideas, the fittings. So basically the fittings are things you can build right away and the ideas are things that will later go into this deck and then you can try to build them. Next we've got a whole stack of characters here. We'll be choosing our starting characters from there later on. Next we've got the visitors deck. And then to the left of that we've got the objectives. Now the way you're gonna do this is you're gonna put the final objective down here. There is only one that comes with the game. Um, when you're playing different scenarios, they'll probably tell you to ignore that and then the scenario will just tell you what the objective is, what the objective is. But if you're playing the basic game, this is your final objective. And we can look at that right now actually. This says, survive. At least one character from the starting group must survive until the end of the game. With each state, hunger, misery, wounds, and illness equal to or less than two. Fatigue is ignored. So you gotta keep your people uh, not hungry, not miserable, not wounded, and not ill. So there you go. That's the final objective. And then you'll put two other objectives. Now this is from a pile of seven, I believe. You'll shuffle them up, pick two randomly without looking at them. That's what I've done here. And uh, yeah, we're gonna, yeah, all right. And we'll put them on top right there. Then you're gonna set up the events deck. Now how this works is um, you've got three ending events, okay? One of them uh, basically says ceasefire. And when you hit that, that means it's the end of the game, but it could be any of these three. So you'll shuffle these up and just put them at the bottom here. Then you'll add the chapter three card. Then you'll go through a deck of 12 events, I believe. You'll shuffle everything up. You'll get four of them randomly, put them here then put the chapter two card. Then out of the remaining events, you'll shuffle them up and get three of them again without looking. And then you'll end by putting the chapter one card on top right here. So that's gonna be all of the chapters you'll have to go through and hopefully you'll survive until you get to that, that card that says ceasefire, all right? Next, uh, going to the left of that, we'll add the locations deck. And we can flip some right away if we want to here. So we've got a derelict squat, an abandoned cottage, and a ruined villa. I'm gonna zoom in on these eventually, don't worry about that. Um, over here we've got the exploration deck, that's when we're gonna go scavenging. The residence deck, uh, to represent people that are living in these houses here that might uh, interact with us. Then we've got the findings deck, which is stuff that you can scavenge and loot. 
And last but not least, the Night Raids deck. That's gonna be about um, when you put someone on guard here during the night, uh, you might encounter, well, you will encounter some people that are gonna wanna break in and uh, break your legs and steal your stuff. And last but not least, we have to cover up this gorgeous artwork <laughs> because uh, the house is not as easily accessible as it seems right here. You're gonna have some closed doors, some rubble, a whole lot of stuff. So let's just do this right now. So you're gonna get the closed doors here, shuffle them up. Next, you've got the rubble, so you'll shuffle it up and start placing it. Next, you've got some heap cards. Then you've got some furniture cards, shuffle those. You guys can't even see that, but way down there, there is another furniture below this rubble here. Now, don't worry, I will be, you know, zooming in and out and doing inserts and all that as we play the game. And the last one here is the bars card, only one, and we'll put it down here. Now they do cover this in the rules very well, but when you set up the residence deck and the night raids deck, you're gonna wanna look through them to identify all the cards that have this symbol on the corner, okay? And you will basically put them aside and because you won't start the game with them right away. So put them aside face down, close to the board. Now at the bottom here we have the storage and in the storage, in the regular game, you will be adding four components, four wood, two water, three raw food, a lockpick and a shovel. And of course, let's not forget to put this token here for the noise and we will need this 10-sided die. You're gonna learn to hate this die. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe the next thing we should do now is actually draw our characters and see who we get. Now the rulebook says that you should start drawing characters randomly and what you should end up with uh, are basically one character that has a red background like this and then two characters that have black backgrounds like this. Um, the red ones are just better. So basically they want one good character and two medium characters. Now if you want to make it easy on yourself, you can choose the characters. Um, but the game says you should just go random. So we'll do that, I guess. All right, so let's start drawing here. We've got Pavel, which is good. He's red, we can keep him. Oh, see, she's red. We cannot keep her, so we'll put her back in the deck. And next we've got Marin. Okay, he's got a black background. That's good. We need another one with a black. And there we go. Anton. Okay, so we've got Pavel, Marin, and Anton. A professor of mathematics. Marin is a garage owner and Pavel is a soccer player. And as for Arika, we're going to put her back in the deck and shuffle this deck. Now we can look at these guys real quick here just so you get an idea. Um, the inventory down here is how many uh, items they can bring back from scavenging. Some items have a weight and some do not. So in this particular case, this person could carry three worth of weight, basically, okay? But this would be free to carry. So three inventory, three and four, so four is the best so far. The prowess here. Prowess is how many times um, that character can re-roll a die when trying to defend in a fight or against, you know, night raids and stuff like that. So that, you know, having a high number here is good. Some characters go up to two, which is awesome. Zero is the pits. And the spirit down here, uh, this has to do with the end of every round, okay? At the end of every round, you're gonna draw a fate card and it's gonna tell you very randomly to resolve either spirit A, B, or C. Uh, the highest uh, likelihood of uh, what's gonna come out is A, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all right? So we've got Spirit A, Spirit C, Spirit A, Spirit B, Spirit B, Spirit A, and Spirit A. So there you go, a lot of Spirit A, a little bit of Spirit B, and I think just one of Spirit C, right? Uh, these things will happen at the end of every round. So if it says Spirit A, well this guy, it's no effect. Very good. <laughs> Here, if it's A or B, this person has a bad habit. It says discard one coffee from the storage or you raise his misery by one. So this guy is so hooked on coffee, uh, he's gonna become miserable if he doesn't drink it every day. Bad, coffee's bad for you, okay? That's A or B. Uh, here on A, it says if there is at least one book in the storage, lower Anton's misery by one, if he is miserable and raises fatigue by one. So I guess, okay. So in this resolve, if there's a book, you lower his misery, but you up his fatigue because I guess he read that book so hard, man. Oh, he got tired. Yeah, so that's what's gonna happen the most. 
in theory. What could also happen is if, if we hit B, it says if Pavel is wounded at level two or three, you raise his misery by one. So this is a guy that you do not uh, want to get wounded because if he's wounded, his misery is gonna raise and misery is a bummer, okay? Misery is a bummer. There you go, that should be printed on a t-shirt. Uh, B, we, we saw here, this guy, if we get B, if Anton is hungry, raises illness by one. Okay, so this guy really needs to be fed. If we get a C here, it says, if there is a guitar in the storage, there is never a guitar in the storage, I'm telling you right now, uh, lower one chosen character's misery by one. So if we have a guitar and we hit C, this guy can play a little song and make someone else feel better, which is fun in theory, but I've never found a guitar ever. Um, here on C is if Marin is miserable, level two or three, race his illness by one. Now, one game that I had, um, I don't remember which guy it was, but it said something like, um, when another character is ill, this guy becomes miserable. Because, like, he doesn't like to see people ill. But, fortunately, we don't have that here. It is very much, like, if this, then that, if this, then that. They don't really cross over or anything, so that's, I guess, good. And, uh, there we go. So, and see if Anton is wounded, raise his wounds by one. I think I read that. So, all in all, you want to keep these things, uh, in check. You know, never forget about the spirit abilities, because sometimes they will get you in bad, bad ways. And let's look here. They have some, uh, special powers here, I guess, special abilities. Pavel here, fleet of foot. When Pavel is in the group fleeing from combat, reduce the number of backstab wounds by two. That's very specific. So if we're in a fight and we run away, this guy kind of helps us to manage the number of wounds we get. But in this game, you want to avoid fighting, okay? Just like on a, from a morality standpoint, you want to avoid fighting and also just Mechanically speaking, if you get in a fight and you get wounded, it's a slippery slope uh, to death. Marin here, the garage owner, he is a handyman, which means during the day actions phase, when using the poke about action, Marin adds three to his black die roll. Cool. <laughs> and poke about is actually just right here. Let me slip the board down there. Boop. So uh, yeah, when you do the poke about action, you roll a die and whatever you get gives you some wooden components. Well, this guy's pretty good. He'll add three to the result, therefore getting more wood and more components. So his job is probably gonna be to do that action every once in a while. So once we have our characters, we're gonna go into this little bag and we're gonna get some miniatures. And there they are. They're actually pretty nice. And then what we'll do is we will uh, assign them some colors, we'll pop these on. And then to track this, you can add these things to their cards. Next, what you're gonna do is look in the rules because all depending on which game you play, which mode of play that, that you choose, um, your characters will start with some stats, okay? If you look at the rules here, it says every character will actually start with a hunger of two. So that's what we're gonna do. And last but not least, we've got all these tokens here. Now this insert comes with the box, which is nice. So we've got the green tokens, which is basically food, the red tokens, that's all the weapons, yellow tokens are meds, bandages, things like that, gray tokens are mechanical things, saw blades, uh, water filters, stuff like that. Um, then we've got the resources, that's uh, wood, water, and component parts. Here we've got some mishmash of things, uh, the dice and some gray tokens that you can write on actually. And next we've got fatigue tokens and hunger tokens, and here we've got illness, wounds, and the uh, ever uh, bummer misery. So keep that close to the board. And now, as I said before, this board is huge. I'm gonna try to show, you know, most of it as I can as I play, but I will be kind of concentrating on specific sections of the board as we play. So this is where I'm gonna keep my characters to the right of the board. So let's get these guys and put them into the house. Just before we start, you guys, I just realized I have not mentioned what empathy is. Um, basically, empathy is um, throughout the game, you might be asked to roll for empathy. Like, I don't know if you come across somebody that just died or something like that, they might say, okay, well, Pavel has to check his empathy. So what you're gonna be doing is rolling this die and comparing the result with what's written here. Now, the lowest empathy you have, well, the easier you're gonna get out of, you know, sad situations, basically. But the higher empathy you have, it's just tough to roll high, right? So yeah, so low empathy is good, high empathy is bad. <laughs> I mean, it's a good thing in real life to have high empathy, but in this game, yeah, it, you might uh, end up having someone become miserable just because they were so empathetic to a miserable situation. So that's what empathy is. So for now, let's just put everyone right here. And I believe we're ready to start the game. All right, so chapter one, let's see what this says. 
Chapter 1. When the Civil War broke out, many people thought that it would only last a couple of weeks. It's been a year since the military surrounded the rebels in the capital, cutting off all supply lines. The civilians still trapped in the city suffer from hunger, disease, and the constant threat of shelling. It's another day of desperate waiting for the end of this terrible war. All right, the rest of this stuff here, we already did that. We have set up the chapter objective deck. So let's see what our first chapter objective actually is. And it is taking care of ourselves. It says at the end of the chapter, each character's misery must be lower than two. And if we manage to do this by the end of the chapter, we get reward unity. For each character, choose any one state and lower it by one. That's all right. And if we don't manage to do this, capitulation. Raise one chosen character's illness by two. Okay, so not the end of the world. Uh, I mean, we still want to try to get this, but uh, the penalty isn't that bad, I find. And it says down here, after determining the objectives, draw the top event card. After you resolve this card, remove it from the game. So we'll remove this from the game, and we'll draw the top event card. And... <laughs> And there we go, it's bad news. All right, raise all characters' misery by one. That's just perfect. <laughs> when we know that what we must do is keep our misery low. Um, but first, what we'll do is add one cold to the cold space. So we'll add a cold token here. This just signifies that the temperature, you know, outside and in the house is getting progressively colder. And um, at the end of each round, if there are too many tokens here, um, basically bad stuff is gonna happen. We'll, we'll look at that when we get to that. And for now, let's raise all characters' misery by one. All right, so there we go. Everybody's misery has been raised by one. Now, the flipping of the, the event card is actually part of the morning phase. Now, I, I won't show you this, this every time, I'm just doing it now, okay? So, morning, it says a new day begins, and you draw an event phase, and then we go on to the day actions. And at the top here, it says a new day begins, outside is an ongoing conflict, and sniper bullets for us. We cannot leave the safety of our shelter, but there are improvements to be made. We should make this place feel more like home. We can use beds, a stove, even a radio. But first, we'll need to clear some space. Hopefully, we might find something useful in this rubble. And uh, yeah, it's daytime and now we get to do some actions. Now, when you want one of your characters to take an action, you just basically take them and put them on the action space. So if you want to do the new idea here, you just put him there and he's gonna do that. If you want to place a new fittings, you just take him and put him there, he's gonna do the place a new fitting action. Uh, same thing with the poke about here, okay? But for some reason, if you, let's say you wanted to do a search action on the furniture here, you would check to see if you could like trace a path, okay? So for example, if you start here, you cannot trace a path to the furniture because it is, you know, barred by essentially bars, right? So if you want to search the furniture, you first have to come down here and take a cut through action. And then later on, you can go do a second action, which would be to search. So you always have to check to see if uh, the spot where you want to go to is accessible. All right, so what are some of the actions that you can do? All right, so new idea. You can go choose two cards from the ideas deck and put them into the fittings deck. We took a look at this during setup. So basically you would go up top over there. So when you take the new ideas action, you look through this deck, you find a card that you want. For example, if you want to, I don't know, build a chair. Well, you're basically now getting the idea to build a chair and you're gonna shuffle it into this deck so that later on, when you take a place a new fitting action, you can go get that card from that deck and then build that chair. Now, another action you could do, as I just said, is place a new fittings, which is basically you take one of these cards, you check the cost on it. For example, this one, you need three components and four wood. And if you have it, you send your guy there, you put your tokens on there, and then it just kind of resolves and you flip it over and now you have a bed on which you can, let's say, take a nap. Now, I won't go through these right now, we'll just go through them as we build them. Another basic action you can do is the poke about action. So you would send someone down here, um, and then you just roll a die and see whatever you can collect here. So if I roll a five or a six, I'd get two wood slash components so I can mix and match, right? So this is just a good way to get some wood and components. Another action you could do is to go here and dig through some rubble, but see it says requires a shovel, and if you don't have a shovel, it requires two characters. So this is a pain in the butt to just get through these cards 
and you would want to do this because you want to go search the furniture because in the furniture you could find I don't know food or water or mechanical parts or a lot of stuff you need to survive so another way to go get stuff that you need is you could send someone over here to search the heap so they just take a search action and you would flip this card over and see what's in the heap in the heap usually it's wood or components stuff like that you could also go over here and pick the lock if you have a lock pick and when we get to that I'll tell you how that works and I believe the last thing that you could do would be to go outside. So you send someone over here, they take the outside action. And if you look here, it says roll the black die first. If a one is rolled, the character placed here is hit by a sniper bullet and suffers two wounds. Two wounds is a lot. Okay, if you get to four wounds, you're dead. Then if you're still alive, uh, you can draw and resolve one visitor card. So you'd go up, up top here and go to the visitor deck and get someone out of this uh, this deck. Now in this deck, you can have people that wanna trade with you. Uh, you can get a fourth character, which I actually might do. But you can sometimes get a, a bad card where it's like, well, it's just a starving neighbor and then you have to give them food. So it is kind of a gamble, but for, for the most part, I'd say like 90% of the cards are okay. So right now in this first round, this is basically everything you can do as far as actions are concerned. Now, when you're trying to see how many actions you can actually do, okay, you're gonna look at these dots here. Let's take this character. Let's say, for example, that he didn't have this token, okay? Each character has three actions. And because there's three white spots here, it means that all of his three actions are doable, okay? He can do three actions. When this comes down here, it means that one of these actions is basically not available. So a character that has one black dot sees his actions reduced by one, okay? If, for example, he had some illness here, he's got two black dots. So he would see his three actions reduced by two. Now you might think, well, hold on, there's three black dots here. There are, but there aren't, okay? This basically means that out of three, there's two actions that you can't do these things do not uh, accumulate, okay? This doesn't mean minus three, it just means minus two. You basically have to see these things like they were stacked like on top of each other, okay? And it's like you're looking through them. Well, the third spot is black, yes. The second spot would be black, yes. And then there's only one spot left. So essentially this character can only take one action, okay? But now, this isn't the case, so essentially what we've got here are three characters who can each do two actions. So what are we going to do with our two actions per character? Before we do that, I should mention that when you send someone to do actions, okay, the actions are resolved simultaneously. So if you send this guy to search and this guy to dig and, uh, I don't know, this guy to cut through, this all happens at the same time. Now this doesn't seem important right now, but it will in the future because, for example, if you send someone to build something that requires, I don't know, two wood, okay, and you don't have that right now, don't think that you'll go here to get two wood and then build the thing with the wood that you just now got. You can't do that at the same time. You would have to get the wood and then he would do something else, and then in the second action, he would then get to use the wood to build the thing. If that makes any sense, okay? So things are simultaneous. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is actually not an action, but what I will do is to eat some food. Now, eating food usually happens in the dusk phase of the game. Right now we're at day. But there is a special rule in the book that says that you can eat food at any time. We're still gonna have to feed our people at the dusk phase, but the thing is, we can eat it right now. And by doing that, it's going to lower the hunger of our characters, therefore giving us one more action. Let me show you what I mean. Now, when you consume raw food, you can drop your hunger down by one, okay? There's all types of food in the game, and we'll get to that when we get to that, but raw food will drop your hunger down by one. So if everybody eats one raw food, basically what's gonna happen is this, and you see now they have three actions. So I'm gonna do that right now with my three characters, and then this is going back in the box, but now all my characters have three actions. What I'm gonna do is I will send Marin outside. Oh boy, this guy got hurt. I'm gonna send Marin outside, and I will send this person over here. That's actually Pavel. 
and uh, I will send my Anton here as well. Now you might be thinking, whoa, hold on, can you actually jump over this stuff? Yes, you can. I actually checked the rules. The only things that block movement are these uh, red cards. So bars, rubble, closed doors, uh, things like that. But you can, you know, I could just send this guy to search that heap and this guy to go do the Pokebat action. That's a legal move. But what I'm going to do is actually this, okay? Now everything resolves simultaneously, so it doesn't really matter in which order you do it. Uh, thematically, it all happens at once. So let's search this heap first. All right, so this says you gain one weapon part, one sugar, five components, and two wood. Okay, so we'll go get that. This here says you gain one lockpick, two components, and five wood. Very cool. Um, I'll resolve everything and then I'll go get my, my supplies. And then we're going to send uh, Marin outside here and hopefully he's not going to get shot in the face by a sniper. Here we go. Oh, that's a seven. I thought it was a one for a second. Okay, so he's fine. Next, we'll go up here, grab the visitor's deck, and hopefully we'll get someone. Yes, all right. So see, this here is an arrival. So let's zoom in on that. It says a wounded stranger asked for shelter. If you decide to take this person in, draw a card from the unused characters deck and add them to your group. Place a level two wounds and a level one hunger token on them. Add a pistol and one ammo to the storage, then remove this arrival card from the game. So essentially we'd get a fourth character, and the maximum you can have is four. Then it says if you decide not to take this person in, you may buy items this person is carrying. And then we check the journal to see how to do that, and then we shuffle this card back into the visitor's deck. Well, the thing is, I do want a fourth character. It is a bummer to have someone arrive that's already wounded and all that, but... Hmm... Now this might sound awesome to you guys, but every time you fire a pistol, you discard an ammo token, and there's just one token with it. So basically, this is a gun that has one bullet in it, which is not uh, not all that hot. So let me think about this. Okay, I've decided we're gonna take somebody in. Um, now you might be thinking, oh, hold on, we could trade, but the only thing we can actually trade with them are these things, okay? You can only trade tokens that have a yellow circled number here. Uh, for example, you cannot, you know, use water to trade, nor wood, nor components, okay? Things need to have a trade value printed on them. And here the trade commission is zero, which is good. Um, if it had said, like, trade commission three, it means you need to pay three over, you know, of everything that you trade. But, um, yeah, so let's not even trade, because I don't have, you know, I want to keep this stuff, okay? I'm just gonna take a random character here and we're gonna have a fourth character, that's it. All right, so wish me luck. Hopefully I'll get somebody good. And, oop, this, okay, this guy fell out, all right? This seems like fate, let's do it. And it's Emilia, she is a lawyer. Prowess of one, which is crappy, but she has a very low empathy, which could be good. Um, she's got a special ability here called Journal, and it says, at the beginning of the Dawn phase, Emilia may raise her fatigue by any amount to lower her misery by the same amount. All right, so I guess she reads her journal and she feels good. Fine. She's got an inventory of three. Okay, empathy three. We got that. And what's her spirit? Oh, yeah, she's got a bad habit. Uh, discard one coffee from the storage or raise Emilia's misery by one. I think we have some... Yeah, Marin. Our guy Marin here. <laughs> These guys are two coffee drinkers. That's going to be horrible. And if we hit B or C, it says if there are at least two cold tokens on the cold space, raise Amelia's misery by one. So she don't like to be cold. <laughs> I mean, nobody does, but she particularly seems to hate it. All right, so very strange. So we've got a lawyer here coming in wounded with a gun. So let's set her up, actually. All right, so here she is, Amelia, with her mini right here. All right, so she is uh, hungry at one, she's wounded at two, she's gonna be green, of course. And as far as this stuff goes, this is gonna go right into the supply. This doesn't belong to her, it belongs to everybody now, so that's in the supply. And you see here, this has got a trade value of 16, so that's a very good item to trade. So this goes into the supply. And now, um, she just came in, and she cannot take an action in the phase in which she came in. And right now we're in the first action phase. Now to track the actions, I'm gonna use some dice, okay? So if you see a six here, it basically means they didn't do anything. 
So this person actually took an action, Anton took an action, and Pavel took an action. Let's put them on the side here, like so. All right, because I can get confused very fast with these things. So all of these three took an action and she took no actions. Then we'll shuffle this card back into the visitor deck. And now we have to finish resolving Pavel and Anton's searches. So we're going to go get a whole bunch of um, stuff and put it in our supply. So let's do that. All right, so this here is all the new stuff that we just got. So total, we got seven wood, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven components. Uh, pistol and ammo, one sugar, one weapon part, and one lock pick. So now I'm just going to take away um, these two cards up here and we'll discard them from the game. The characters will come back. She's going to come back. He's going to come back. Okay, so for the second action phase, what I'm going to do is I will send my Pavel here to dig through. I will send Emilia here to uh, place a new fittings, okay? Actually, you remember how I said you need to go up there to take the action? That's, that's not how that works. How that works is you have to go to a clear room and then you take that action, okay? So I imagine there's these little hands everywhere where rooms are empty, okay? So she's gonna go here to do place of fittings. And the fitting she's gonna try to place is actually a bed, okay? So she's gonna try to build a bed. Well, she's gonna, I say try, but we have everything we need. We need three components and four wood. So you actually take your three components and your four wood. So these are assigned to that. Then we're gonna send Marin to do the poke about action because he's good at doing that because he's got a special ability. And then why don't we try using the lock pick on this closed door? So let's do the lock pick first because we haven't done that yet. So he's going to use the lock pick, and to do that, you have to roll the d10. So if you hit one, two, three, there's no effect. You failed. You just wasted your action. Yeah, them's the ropes. If you roll four to ten, you actually discard the lock pick, so it goes back in the box. But you open the door. So let's give that a shot right now. And it's fine. So we did manage to open the door, but it's kind of like we broke the lock pick at the same time. So this goes back in the box. And now let's see what we got here. Okay, we gain three wood. Now you see, this is a situation where I'm instructed to gain three wood, but there are only, there's only one wood left in the box or in the world. So what I can do right now is to take one of these, put it here, to say that I own five wood and everything that's in here, right? So then I'll take five wood and I will put them back in the box. And now, because the game instructs me to gain three wood, I'm gonna get three wood out of there. One, two, and three. So that's how you kind of play around with these resources. I'm not a big fan of that system, but you know, it makes some kind of sense. So we'll remove this. Next, let's uh, actually build the bed. So this will go back in the box, so will this. And the bed is now built. So essentially from now on, or from the next action phase and throughout the game, we can now take a nap. And take a nap will lower the fatigue of the character placed here by two. Now, so far we have not spent fatigue, but you'll see uh, how that works in a little bit. And it says here, note, sleeping in a bed for a whole night removes all fatigue from a character. We'll get to that when we get to that. All right, next, we wanted to dig through the rubble here. So for one action with a shovel, we will dig. So let's flip that. And oh, look at that. Yeah, all rubble cards are the same. You have to do them twice. That's a huge time waster, okay? But that's just how it is. Uh, good thing we had a shovel or else we would have had to put uh, two characters on there. So probably next action phase, we'll have someone come over here to dig through again and then we'll remove the card giving us access to the furniture. Uh, last but not least here, we've got Marin here. He's gonna use the poke about action and because of his special ability way down here, he's gonna add three to the, to the result of the black die. So let's do that, let's roll. Ugh, wow. <laughs> well, two plus three is five, so that would be two wood slash components. So we're gonna go to the box and we will get, I'm gonna say two wood. Okay, so that was everyone's action. So Anton took a second action, so did Pavel, uh, so did Marin, and Emilia took her only action that she could take because 
of these things here. So now we've got these three characters that can still take one more action. Let's see what we're gonna have them do. All right, so I've thought about this. So what's gonna happen is we will be sending, let's say, Anton to dig with the shovel. We will then... Now you see, I'm gonna stop myself here. I wanted to build two things, like place two new fittings, but you can't do that. Because if you look at the what's written up here, you can only put one character to place a fitting. That's what that logo means. That means like one character taking one action. So I can't build two things at once, which is a bummer. <laughs> okay, so I need to rethink this. I mean, one thing is for sure, I think we will build a simple heater, all right? So someone is gonna go to place a new fitting and we're gonna build a simple heater because we do have a girl in our group that does not like to be cold, so. Let's put that over here. So let's send a Pavel here with five components. One, two, three, four, five, and three wood. Okay. And now, Marin still has an action that he could do. Well, I think what I'm gonna have him do is go get a new idea. And that idea is gonna be up here build a chair <laughs> that's quite the idea he's got there so i'm gonna take build a chair and i will put it now in the fittings deck so this is now available for us to construct later on now why would i want to build a chair well a chair essentially uh, helps you to get rid of misery okay you can have your people like have a little sit and it's gonna you know help to lower their misery so all right so new idea boom that's done that's up here this guy is digging, so let's resolve that. We'll remove it from the game. And then Pavel here will build a simple heater. So this goes away. And now in this room, we have a simple heater. And from now on, we can do the make a fire action. And it says for each two wood or two books or one wood and one book, we can discard one cold token. And you'll see that cold tokens um, can become a bit of bad news. <laughs> so this is a, not a bad thing to have. All right, so let's bring everybody back to the middle here. All right, so that's a third action, a third action, a third action. So everybody has taken their actions. And now we would move on to the dusk phase. Now, if we look at the dusk phase in the book here, it says dusk. The sun has disappeared beneath the horizon. Shadows and darkness now rule over the city. It is a bit safer to go out at this time, but first, we must regain some strength. Now, dusk is basically just, uh, you're gonna have your characters drink and eat. Now, each character should drink one water, discarded from the storage. If they don't drink, or if you decide to not have them drink, you're gonna roll a die, and they might become hungry or miserable. Okay, I'd rather have them hungry than miserable, by the way. Next, what you'll do is feed them. So if you discard a canned good from the storage, you'll lower their hunger by two. If you discard a raw wood, you're lower, you will lower it by one. And if you discard a vegetable, the hunger stays the same. But if you do not feed them, you raise their hunger by one. So let's look at this in practice. Right now in the storage, if we're gonna have them drink, we have only two water. So two people will drink and two will not. I mean, we don't have to. You know, we could just keep that and just let them go <laughs> hungry or go miserable. So, um, I think that what I'm gonna do is, okay, because she has a special ability that helps her get rid of misery, I'm gonna gamble it, okay? I'm gonna give, I'm not gonna give her the water. I will actually give Anton the water and then Marin. And my reasoning is this, this has to do with their spirit abilities, okay? I'm trying to look uh, into the future a little bit here, okay? If we see here, if Anton is hungry, you raise his illness by one. So if I don't give him water, he could become either miserable or hungry. And I don't want him to get hungry, because he could get ill. So I'm giving him water. Same with this guy here. If Marin is miserable, raise his illness by one. Now, he is miserable, but if he doesn't drink, he could either become more hungry or more miserable. And again, miserable level two or three will raise his illness so yeah I'm gonna give these two guys the water and they will have nothing okay so we discard this and then we'll have to roll the die for these two so let's roll for Pavel I'm gonna roll it over here oh that's a two 
Okay, so two will raise his hunger by one. And next we'll roll for Amelia. That's an eight. Ooh, that's bad, I think. Yeah, that's gonna raise her misery by one. Well, she wasn't miserable to begin with, but uh, now she is. <laughs> Okay, next we gotta feed these people, and if you remember, in our supply, we don't have any food at all, okay? We already ate the food, so everybody will have their hunger raise by one. So, this would go to level two, so would this, so would Amelia, and now, oh boy, yeah, I should have taken that into consideration. This guy's gonna go at hunger level three. Oh boy, we're gonna have to find some food big time because in the next round, if Pavel doesn't eat and he raises to level four, he's dead. <laughs> Simple as that. If any of your states reach level four, except for fatigue, you're pretty much dead. And when someone dies, it's gonna make other people miserable. So you're gonna raise their misery. And if they get too miserable, they will die causing other people to get miserable. It's a vicious cycle. You have to keep these things in check. And of course, I gotta let that thing slip. There you go, bad gamer. Now that all this is done, we move on to the evening phase. And it says here, evening, before nightfall, we must decide who will stay in the shelter to regain strength or guard the door and who will venture into the ruined city. We can only hope to scavenge some food, meds and other necessary materials. So now what you're gonna do in this phase is, well, exactly what it says here. You're gonna send some people scavenging, you will put one person on guard duty or more, and if they're too tired, you're gonna have them sleep either in a bed or on the floor. Now, if you send someone to scavenge or if you send them to guard the door, you will give them fatigue. So that's what we're gonna do, okay? So we will be sending Emilia to uh, do some scavenging. We will send Marin to be the guard, Pavel will also come scavenging, and so will Anton. Yeah, so three people to scavenge and one to guard. That's pretty risky, just one person to guard, but uh, yeah, them's the ropes. I gotta go shopping for stuff. <laughs> so Marin will be on guard duty, and my three other characters will go scavenging. And I've decided to send them to the ruined villa. We'll zoom in on that shortly. Now, when you send people scavenging, they can bring stuff with them. Now, why would you do that? Well, when um, you get to the night raids phase, okay, maybe bad guys are gonna come in, beat up Marin, and uh, come in to steal some of our stuff. But if we bring our stuff with us, they can't steal it, right? So that's one of the ways that you can kind of mitigate that. That being said, um, Bringing wood and water and components aren't really worth it because from experience uh, the bad guys don't really steal that stuff Okay, they steal tokens not resources. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'll be bringing along the shovel the lockpick um, The pistol the sugar and the ammo now I could leave the pistol here and actually equip it with Marin and maybe that would seem like a good idea, but the thing is this is worth 16 and if I can meet someone to trade with them That's gonna be worth a lot and I'm gonna be able to trade a lot of stuff for it. So that's my reasoning behind it now All of these guys combined have an inventory of 10 which is a lot Okay, and right now they can carry one two three if I had uh, had stuff uh, that weighed more than 10 I, They couldn't bring it with them. Okay, but now they have three weights here on 10. That's fine. So we're gonna go scavenging in the ruined villa. So in scavenging here it says, it is safer to move around the city at night. Shots can still be heard, but only sporadically. You strap your backpacks on tightly and leave your shelter. Carefully, you pick your way through ruined shops and houses that lined the shelled streets. So we will choose a location, we will choose our equipment, but we don't have any, and uh, set the noise marker to one. And here we go. So if we look at this uh, quickly here, we're at the ruined villa. It says you can return two exploration cards to have a look around the area, C422. Now, I don't know if we're gonna do that, but we can do it at any time. So we'll see if we wanna do that, we'll, we'll get into it when we get into it. But for now, let's create the exploration deck with 14 cards. Now, the number 14 is the number of cards that you will be uh, using to kind of go through, okay? And these cards are also your 
they kind of represent time, okay? These cards have a, lot, have a lot of things on them, okay? You can go through a door or some rubble, uh, you can find some stuff, uh, people can see you, you can see here, search the furniture, um, search the heap. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff in there, okay? But as I said, this deck is basically your time, so time that you spend um, kind of scavenging through this building, okay? And the way this works is, you will be flipping cards one by one and resolving them, and then uh, you can you can decide to leave like at any time. Like if you figure if you find that you have enough stuff or whatever, you can just decide to stop exploring and then you just move on to the next phase. Okay, so the scavenging phase would then end. So in essence, the the higher number of cards that you have here, in this case fourteen, uh, the better because then you have more time and more cards, so you might find more stuff, right? But that's not the only thing to take into consideration. Let's actually uh, look at the location here real quick. And I will actually leave this down here somewhere so we don't have to move the camera every time. Um, some of these locations have these things up here, okay? So this location has basement entrance, rubble, and jammed door. Some of these cards, um, if they if they come out and it says, let's say, basement entrance, it, it might require you to like waste some time just to get down there, okay? so. Like, even though we have 14 cards in here, if it's 14 cards but there's a basement entrance, I'm probably going to lose three or four cards of time just to enter that basement. So you're going to have to, you know, check that out. Um, now, our three locations that we have do have this mention here of basement entrance. Like, all three of them, it says basement entrance. So I, I was like, okay, you know what? Let's just take the one that has the most cards. But, um, in another situation where, let's say, the, the 14 location had basement entrance, but the 12 location didn't have basement entrance, I probably would have taken the 12. Because, uh, again, basement entrance makes you lose cards, okay? Um, if you see rubble here, it means that you're probably going to need a shovel to clear that rubble, or else you'll discard the card. And jam door, I believe you need a uh, lockpick, okay? The, there might be something else like bars. If it says bars up here, well, if you bring your uh, saw blade, if you have one, well, then you can cut through the bars. Or else you'll just discard the card, or or I think it'll make you waste time. But anyway, let's uh, let's just start building the, this deck, and you'll see uh, what I mean with all of this stuff. Now, you might have, uh, you know, I, I could just start flipping cards, okay? And you know what? Let's do actually one or two, but then I want to get to this stuff right here, okay? But let's start exploring just so you guys see what it looks like. So here we go. All right, it says you may ignore this card. In that case, you just keep drawing. You can even end the exploration, fine, or you could actually search the furniture. To do so, you return two exploration cards. So you would take two cards off of here and put it back there. That means you're kind of wasting time searching the furniture, which is, you know, that's the main mechanic of, of this whole thing. Or you could raise the noise by one and roll for the noise in order to draw and resolve one card from the findings deck in the furniture chart. Now, just so you know what we're talking about here, these cards pretty much all look like this, okay? So you would go to the furniture, because that's what it says here. You'd get a knife, a shell, a cigarette, and then you would roll the die on the special findings chart. So you could get something like a bonus, okay? That's what this means. Now, these are all different. They all have different things on them, so I'll just shuffle that up. Now, um, the options that they give you here, okay, so return two cards, so boom, boom, we waste a little bit of time, or we raise the noise and roll for noise. So there's a red puck up there, okay, and it goes from one to eight. So raise it by one, so it, it would go from one to two, and then we would roll the die, and if we roll a number that's equal to or lower the new number, which is two, well then someone would hear us, and we'd, we'd have to draw a residence card. And in this deck, you've got nice people, but mostly iffy people or bad people, okay? Like you might meet some, like an old couple who are like, oh, hello, and they'll want to trade stuff with you, which is nice. But in this deck, there's also soldiers who just want to steal your stuff and people who want to beat you up and pick a fight, okay? And uh, in this game, you don't want to pick a fight. You don't want to fight. You want to sneak around. You want to be quiet. Uh, violence is never the answer, okay? Unless you are armed to the teeth, you do not want to fight, all right? So that's just my tip for you. So what are we going to do right now? Well, oh, by the way, it says private here. Private just means that if for some reason there was a face-up resident card and you would search something, 
that means that it uh, basically belongs to them. And there's gonna be a, a face-up card somewhere telling you like, if you have searched a private item, yada, yada, yada. Like somebody might be more inclined to pick a fight with you because you're going through their furniture. But right now, you can like disregard this because there's nothing in the game right now that's talking about these uh, this logo right here. So what I'm gonna do is I think because I don't want to waste time. Okay, I will I will raise the noise by one and roll for noise. Okay, so let's do that. All right, so raise it by one and roll, and now hopefully we get something that's higher than a two, and it's fine. So nobody heard us. So this means that we are fine to search the furniture. So we'll grab the findings deck. We'll shuffle it. You always shuffle at every deck in this game. You. <laughs> Before drawing, you pretty much always shuffle. So let's do that, and... All right, so in the furniture, we find a herb, a mechanical part, and a weapon part. So I'm gonna go get that from the box. All right, so here they are. Um, just so you know quickly what these things do eventually. Uh, weapon part, you can trade it for two. It's got a weight of one, so it's kind of a bummer to carry around. Uh, you can use this thing to fix a weapon. If you have another token that says broken weapon, you can put them together, I believe, by using a uh, like a workstation that you would build in your house, okay? But I've never actually gone through the trouble of building a weapon. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, the mechanical part has a trade value of two, a weight of one, and you can use this for a lot of stuff in the house, okay? Uh, like if you want to build a trap or something, um, it, a lot of stuff uses mechanical parts. So this, this is good, we're gonna want to keep that. This is a herb, it's got a trade value of one, it does not weigh anything, so we can bring it back. Um, herbs I've never actually used, but I know you can build a herb garden in your house. And if you have enough herbs and enough stuff, then you can make like medicine, okay? But I think it's a long drawn out process. I've never actually gone through the trouble of doing that. But there we go. This is what we have found. I'm gonna put all of this stuff back with our findings with the pistol and all that. Now when you put stuff up there, it doesn't mean that you're gonna bring it back with you. It just means that you're kind of, I guess, you've stashed it somewhere around the location. And at the end of the phase, you're going to decide what you actually bring back to the house. All right, so then if we keep looking here, there's a picture of a die, which means that we can roll the black die for a uh, special findings. And that's this over here. So if you look here, special findings on a one to four, it's nothing on a five. It's a book six to seven. It's another mechanical part. Eight to nine is raw food, which would be great. And ten is a knife, which is also very good. So let's roll the die, see what we get. That is a seven, uh, another mechanical part. All right, well, we're gonna have a more, uh, more mechanical parts than we need. All right, so here it is, I'll put it up top with the others. Okay, so now we can keep exploring. But you know what, before I do that, I really wanna do this. Well, just to show you guys, okay? Pretty much all of the location cards have a, uh, an orange text here that pretty much tells you you can waste some time to kinda have a look around. And when you do that, you go through the book of scripts and you read a, a, you know, a little bit of flavor text. Sometimes it's just flavor text. Sometimes it's useful, like you could meet someone who wants to trade or someone who wants to beat you up. <laughs> but usually it's okay, right? So I think we're gonna do this now. So yeah, let's do it. So I'm gonna return two cards and we're gonna go read entry 422 in the book of scripts. All right, so here it is right in the middle here, 422. Wow, okay, no flavor text. It just says, roll the black die. Oh, that's ominous. Okay, well, let's do it. <laughs> and we'll see what we get. All right, here goes. That's a seven. Lucky seven, I guess. Ooh, look at that. On a result of seven, see 1199. All right, let's go there. All right, here we go, 1199. It seems to be a ransom note. We've got your son locked up in his house. If you try to raid the place, we'll kill him. If you don't bring the money, we'll kill him slowly. So you better hurry. 10,000 or he's dead. Back to game. Wow. Okay, so that was just... <laughs> okay, so we gained nothing from that. But uh, yeah, some, some uh, shady uh, dealings are going on here. So I think we could do it again if we really want to. Do we want to? Ouch. I don't know. No. Damn. I wish it would have been something good. I really want to trade with people. Okay, um, we can always try this later on, okay? Like, instead of drawing a new card, you can do this. I don't, I mean, I don't think there's anything in the rules that say that you can't do this twice, right? I mean, if, if you guys think there is, let me know, but I really don't think so. So for now, let's keep exploring, and if we get bored of that, we can do that again and hopefully roll something else. So let's keep exploring. Oh, this should go away, by the way. 
All right, so let's explore. Wow, okay. So it's another private here. You may ignore this card or search the heap. Okay, in the heap usually, I guess it's like wood, maybe mechanical parts. Uh, yeah. So it says return two exploration cards and raise noise by one. Okay. Or raise the noise by one and roll for noise. Two, draw and resolve one card from the findings deck. Heap chart. Um, do we chance it? We could raise the noise by one and roll. I guess, because it's going to be at three, which isn't, you know, that bad. Or we waste time again. Grrr. No, you know what? I think I'm going to... Or we can ignore this card, because I, maybe I don't care about the heap. Seeing as how what's in the heap is stuff that I don't need right now, like I, right, I've made a list, okay, I need coffee, <laughs> water, and bandages. And this will give me none of that, so I will just ignore this card, alright? So let's keep drawing. Ah, again with search the heap. No, ignore. Nice. Tough luck. Roll for noise. All right, well, that happened. So we're at two right now on the noise track up there. So I got to roll higher than two. Did you, yes, it's a, I keep rolling sevens. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, see here it says closed door. So you got to check here. And if it says closed door, you would put this aside and it would have like an ongoing effect, okay? But we don't have that. So let's not even read that right now. So it actually says if there is no closed door, discard this and draw a new card from the exploration deck. So let's do that, okay? Whenever we, it, like if we get to one of these things and it activates, we'll get, we'll go through it. Oh my god! <laughs> I think this game really wants us to search the heap. Oh my god. <laughs> Alright, you know what, let's just do it. Um, I will raise the noise by one, okay, so I, I won't show you up here, but it's going up to three. Let's roll this, we gotta get three or more. Uh, four or more, actually. Okay, we're good. Alright, so let's search the heap. So let's cycle this a little bit. Okay, there we go. Okay, so in the heap, we get electrical part, chems, and cigarette. Alright, let's go get that. Alright, here is all this stuff. Um, cigarettes, uh, we're not gonna use them that much. Because you can get characters who really like to smoke, and if they don't smoke, they get miserable. But right now, uh, our people like to drink coffee, so. But this still has a trade value of one, cost nothing to carry around. Chems, tra trade value of one. You would use this stuff for various things, maybe making uh, medicine. Uh, you can also use this if you build like a rat trap in the house. Uh, this would lure in some rats and then you can eat the rats, yay. Um, electrical part has a trade of three, a weight of one, and this is useful for building a lot of stuff in the house. So let's put that up there. And then we will get to roll on the special findings chart and yeah, let's do that. Hopefully we get something good. It's a five, a book. <laughs> All right, we found a book. Now books aren't that bad. Uh, trade value of one, okay, but uh, they carry nothing, they, uh, they cost nothing to carry around. And you can actually use those, you, you could burn a book in our simple heater that we've made. You can burn a book and some wood to, uh, you know, get warmer. But um, also when you build the chair, um, if somebody sits down on the chair with a book, they can get less miserable. <laughs> yeah, I know. Those are some really good books. Okay, so we'll discard this and we'll keep going. Oh, here we go. I think I saw something. Return as many exploration cards as you wish and roll the black die. Add the number of the returned expiration cards to the result. Okay, so return three, let's say, so plus three in my die roll. Then on a result of one to five, I draw and resolve a residence card. Ugh. Yeah, so this basically, yeah, somebody kind of spotted us. This is getting pretty thin. Look, I'm, I think I'm just gonna chance it. And if anything, we'll meet a resident and you guys will see what happens, okay? But this is a very risky move. I do not advise doing this, okay? So if I roll a one to five, um, we're gonna meet somebody. You guys, <laughs> I swear to you, there's no editing here. This is actually what I'm rolling. Seven, 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 this, all right. So we're not gonna meet anyone, which is crazy. Okay, fine. So let's keep exploring. Okay, search the furniture. So we, we can ignore this or we can return two cards to search or raise the noise by one and roll for noise to draw and resolve a furniture card. Um. Okay, I think I'm gonna discard two cards. And then we'll draw a findings card to search the furniture. 
Whenever I shuffle cards like this, I always get the feeling that I'm gonna land exactly in the same one as before. <laughs> Did I? No, okay. So, all right, I'll put it here, there we go. So furniture, I get a lockpick, some sugar, and some meds. Oh, meds is good, because meds uh, gets rid of illness. Now, we don't have anybody who's ill right now in the group, but uh, long term, that might happen, so I'm glad to get that. All right, so here is everything. Uh, like I said, meds is good. It's got a trade value of 10, so that's pretty good if you want to trade. If we can, you know, find someone to trade eventually. Uh, sugar weighs one, costs three. Um, you can use sugar to make moonshine, if you have a moonshine distillery thing that you can build, but I've never actually done that. And why would you want moonshine? Well, you can drink moonshine to kind of feel better. <laughs> It kind of makes you drowsy, like your fatigue is going to raise, but your misery will go down, all right? And a lockpick, always good, because as you've seen, um, if you use a lockpick successfully, you discard it. So having more of these is never a bad thing. And then in the furniture, we get to roll a die, so let's do that before we move all of this stuff up there. It's an eight. Yes, 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 raw food, yes! Well, I'm getting really excited here, but I mean, it's just one raw food. We would need like four, okay? Um, this caught this is 10 to trade which is nice weighs only one so all right We really needed that so I'm, I'm glad we got that so let's put all of this stuff with our findings up top And now let's see what we got here. We've got three cards left. We could return two to do this again hopefully have something or we could just draw and hopefully, um, you know find a pantry because the pantry is pretty much the only place where you can find food, right? But see, even there, let's say this, let's say we, it would have said search a pantry and this is the card we would have gotten. It's only one raw food and then some moonshine and then roll the die. So you'll never find like a ton of food on one card, okay? So really the best way to get exactly what you need, like if you have a grocery list of what you need, the best way is to find someone to trade with. Now, some of the locations will have a red bar at the bottom that says, if you wish to trade, go to, you know, one, two, three, four, five in the book. And then you just trade with someone, which is amazing. Because then you can, you know, all depending on who you meet, they might just, you know, give you exactly what you need. But that's not the case right now. None of the R3 locations had that. So I was really hoping to, you know, with some of this, this flavor text, uh, hoping to get you know, some some story that says I can meet someone to trade with. I don't, you know, I don't think I'm gonna find like a, uh, a butt ton of food in there. So let's do that again. Okay, let's do it. So we're gonna go to 422 to have a look at the ruined villa. And now you guys, I, I don't wanna cheat, but if I roll a seven again, I, uh, I'm i gonna have to reroll, okay. So here we go, roll the black die, okay. And it's a three, all right, good. Uh, and then can you see this here? Like on a three, it's one six six six. Let's do that. All right, one six six six, right in the middle of here. It's an old villa in a rich neighborhood. People say some deserters from the army have chosen it as their hideout. They might be dangerous and suspicious of strangers, but they probably have lots of supplies, like military rations of canned food. <laughs> yeah, I wish. It might be very dangerous. Deserters are not disciplined soldiers. During this scavenging, when you are told to draw a residence card for the first time, instead search the deck for the deserters card and resolve it. Aw oh, man, see if we had gotten that right at the get-go, you know, we probably could have traded with some deserters. Ah, oh, that's too bad, dang. All right, all right, so that was a gamble. And now we have one card left. Um, we could just leave or try to resolve it. I don't think anything bad can happen there, unless it says like roll for noise and then we get busted. But I say let's just do it. So let's do it. Ah, rubble. Okay, and we do have rubble. Okay, let's read this here. All right, check the current location card for rubble. Okay, if there is rubble, you may resolve this card immediately or place it on the exploration slot and resolve it later instead of drawing a new exploration card. All right, so you either resolve it now or you kind of put it on the side and deal with it later. So what can we do? We can dig through, requires a shovel. We do have a shovel, but it says return one exploration card. We can't. Raise the noise by one, yada, yada, yada. So we can't do that. We can't. Dang. Ah, oh, that's too bad. But let's say we could have done it, okay? So you return an exploration card, you raise the noise by one, and roll for noise. Hopefully you don't meet anyone. And then, after digging through, you add five cards. So put five cards back in here. You draw and resolve two findings card. Dang in the heap chart, which is not the best chart for us right now. 
So all in all, I'm kind of disappointed that this didn't work out, but, you know, we would have gotten heap stuff, which, you know, we already have a heap of. Oh boy. Okay. <laughs> all right, so the scavenging is now done. So we'll return these cards to the deck and we'll go look up top at our findings. And now we have to decide what we're gonna bring back. All right, so location card is back here. We'll drop this down. So look at all of this stuff. Now, um, as I said before, we have an inventory of 10, okay? Combined with these three guys. So let's just look at what actually weighs something, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, we could actually bring everything back because everything that doesn't have a weight icon, we can just take with us, no problem. So we could take everything back, but the rules say that when you're um, figuring out what to bring back, you can also decide to bring back components, wood, and water for a weight of one each. And I think we're gonna have to do that because remember, we've got four characters in the house and they will need to drink in the next round. And if we haven't found any water in the house, um, yeah, we're gonna be up, uh, up uh, Shirt Creek without a paddle. So, I'm gonna wanna bring back a little bit of water. So that's gonna take four weight. Okay, so let's uh, calculate this here. So that would be one, two, three, four. Okay, so I'll. this is my four weight here. I wanna bring back the shovel for sure. So we're at five. Um, I want the mechanical part, so that's six. Let's keep the gun for seven. Let's do the food for eight. And then we got two things we're gonna bring back. I don't think I want sugar. Uh, I think maybe the electrical part and the mechanical part. Yeah, is that is that 10? Let's count that again. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Yeah, that right there, that stuff here is 10. So we will bring everything else with us except the ones with the weight icons here. So the weapon part and the two sugars. Now, what you can do with this, okay, and this is like an advanced rule, all right? It's not a little bit of a parenthesis here. This game um, has rules that you follow as you play, okay? But there are hidden rules. You might have read about that. You can go get them on BGG and I'll put a link uh, below and you can go get them. They are rules that you can play with um, if you know about them, strangely, okay? Like if you don't know about them, just play regularly. But if you know about them, then you can use them. Now, I'm not sure how you even get to discover these hidden rules. I guess through certain events, it'll say, oh, you can now do this, you know, forever in your games. It's, it's a weird thing, okay? So I say just go look at the hidden rules and use whichever ones that you feel you're comfortable with. That being said, one of these special or hidden rules is the fact that instead of putting back in the box everything that you're not bringing with you, you can leave them on the location. So if ever you're lucky enough to come back there, you can, you know, try taking these things again. So I'm gonna do that, but honestly, I, you know, I, I don't really want this stuff that much, but I'm gonna leave them there just because. And uh, if we ever go back there, you know, maybe if we need them, we can try taking them again. So for now, we're bringing back all of this stuff down here, plus all of this stuff up here. Now, I will not move this right away because right now this is the end of the scavenging phase. And now we have to go to the night raids phase, which is my least favorite phase of the game because bad things always happen. So story-wise, while we are kind of still figuring out our thing at the other end of town, our poor guy down here, Marin, is trying to defend the house, possibly against a night raid. So if we look at the rule book here, so if you see here up top, it says, meanwhile in the shelter, someone came in the night to steal our belongings. All right, so if we had any weapons, we would give it, uh, you know, if we had a weapon, we'd give it to Marin, but we don't. And then we draw a night raids card. Um, now you might be thinking, yeah, we have a weapon. No, we, we, we do, but it's with these guys, okay? So Marin does not have a weapon. So let's draw a Night Raids card right now and see what we get. Okay, so poor Marin here is on guard. There's not a lot of cards in there right now, um, but we will add some more soon and you will see. Okay, so we shuffle this up. Now in the first few rounds, this deck is not so bad. I mean, it's still bad, but it's not like catastrophic, okay? And hopefully we'll draw something that isn't too hurtful. All right, here we go. Oh, okay, this could be good or bad. Okay, just so you guys see what's actually in there, okay? We've got starving people, starving people, hobos, 
memories, which is like pretty much the best thing you can get. Well, it depends. It's, you'll basically uh, see who the character is, what misery level they're at, and you'll read a bit of story. It might just give you some story about this guy. Maybe you'll learn that he, I don't know, left his wife and he's feeling bad about it. And anything could have happened, okay? I really like these. This is a lot of flavor. And usually, I mean, I guess unless the misery is super high, I've never had anything extremely bad on this. So I'm glad when I see that, okay? So there you go. So like three raids, basically, a memories, and this, Reality Impact. You're gonna see these types of cards uh, uh, all over the place. You might see them in the findings deck, you might see them uh, even in the events. And what this is, is basically it's telling you to like stop the game and go read something in the book. So that's always pretty cool. It could be dark, but it could be good. <laughs> Alright, so let's read this. It says, something unexpected has happened. Draw a card from the colors deck to determine the color of the script. Alright, so you go to the side of the board here and we have these color cards. This is just a way to randomize the events in the game, okay? So you've got red, black, gray, blue, and green. And you might have noticed a lot of cards have these little icons at the bottom here, okay? That's like the, the so one card could say go in another deck and resolve, you know, the number that corresponds with the color that you've just drawn. It's of it's it's a very um, it's a very smart way of really randomizing what's going on uh, thematically in the game, and strangely, it just it always kind of works. Uh, it, it's weird. Like thematically, I've had some very very interesting moments here where you're like, where? Wait, was this planned out? I mean, anyway, it's pretty cool. Um, so you've got green, you've got red. Now they say that you can remove this from the game because they depict drastic scenes. Okay. You could walk in somewhere and somebody has, you know, their head blown off. And if you don't like that kind of stuff, remove that card from the game. But then again, if you're not, you know, I mean, th this this game is harsh and brutal, so I'd say keep it in. The black one you can also remove because it depicts blind and merciless fate in the sense that you th this is like, well, you were walking down the street and bam, a sniper shot you. Okay, this is what that could be. So if you're not into that, uh, remove that from the game. Now I've left it in for the purpose of the purposes of this playthrough. Um, gray I have found that is often awesome. Okay, every time that I've had a gray event, the game has given me something really good. Okay, like I'll find a special item that doesn't exist. So I'll take a gray token out of the box, and you'll write on that token, and it'll, it'll be something awesome. Okay, I'm not I'm not guaranteeing that this is always going to be awesome, but it happened to me three or four times, and every time it, I was like, wow. Uh, blue, I think, is also good. So there we go, okay? So we got to get a color card out of the deck, and it's green, okay. And then it says, reveal the top card of the Night Raids deck and check the number with that color on it. All right, so there we go. So that's, you know, that's just a random thing. So we'll shuffle that, all right. Okay, so green green 290 so then we'll look in the book and go read 290 all right here we go 290 first we heard someone fiddling with our door then we heard some rustling at the back of the house finally we don't know how some people have got inside we hear footsteps upstairs we get ready for a fight and stand at the stairs when they see us they freeze after a moment we hear one of them say we're sorry we're not robbers we thought the house was empty we haven't taken anything. We'll leave right away. We're just looking for something to eat. They leave through the door a moment later. A woman, an older man, and a teenage boy. They looked like a family. We closed the door behind them. Back to game. Wow. Okay, good. Well, I mean, bad for them. But uh, nobody, nobody actually came in to beat us up, which is always a good thing. Whew. Okay, pretty cool. So we'll put this card back in the colors deck. Put this back on the side of the board. This is going to go back in the night raids. So that's it as far as what happened to Marin that night. Next, in the night raids phase, we have to do what they call the crime wave. Now, if you remember at the setup, I had you put aside a lot of these cards, okay? So residence cards and night raids cards, all with a red exclamation mark on the sides, okay? Um, these are basically worse versions of the night raids and visitors, uh, residents that are already in the game. So in the crime wave phase of the game, what you do is you have to take two cards, okay, either two from here, two from here, or one of each, okay, and you have to shuffle them in their respective decks. 
Now you could just, you know, like in my first game, I was like, all right, whatever, I'll take one here, one here, and that's that. But here's my new rationale. Um, residents you can avoid, okay? If you sneak around a building and you're very, very quiet, like Elmer Fudd, be very, very quiet, you can actually manage to maybe not meet anyone. But the reverse, the night raids, I mean, now we got lucky, we got this, you know, unexpected thing happening, but usually you'll draw a card and somebody's gonna beat you up. And these are all bad versions of people beating you up, okay? So because night raids cannot really be avoided, I would say put two residents card in the resident deck and no night raids card in the night raids deck for as long as that's humanly possible. So that's what we're gonna do. So we'll shuffle this up, take two residents, and we'll put them at the bottom here in the residents deck and then we'll just get rid of that for now. And the game will have you do this, this operation uh, at every night raid phase uh, until the events up top tell you otherwise, okay? So for now, the night raid phase is complete and we move on to dawn. All right, here we go at dawn. It says another day of survival. We must not give up. So the scavenging party is gonna return with all their stuff. If we have meds or bandages, we're gonna assign them to characters. I'll talk about that. And then we have to draw a fate card and a narrative action card. So let's do everything in order and I'll explain as we go. All right, so I've put all our new stuff down here. Um, this is what we had before and this is all the new stuff. So we have everything here. Our characters will come back to the house to say, hi Marin, we had a good night, everything is cool, nobody got hurt, how was your night? I was fine, thank you, I met a family, but uh, they left, no, nothing got stolen, hooray. Good, then the game says you can assign meds and uh, bandages, okay? Now we do have meds, but if you remember, none of our characters is ill. So there, so you can't assign meds to them. There would be no reason to do that, okay? We'll see later on, if somebody gets ill, you would just, you know, take a meds token and put it on their character card on the side there. And then, if you're lucky, the game will let you heal that person. Okay, and we'll see how that happens in, well, actually right now, okay. So uh, we're not gonna assign meds because nobody's uh, ill. I would like, you know, I, I would have liked to have found bandages because Emilia is wounded, but we don't have any. So yeah, there we go. So now uh, what we need to do is draw a fate card. Now fate cards is probably my least favorite thing in the game. Um, you'll see what they do, but these cards, and you will shuffle them every time you draw them, okay. Now these cards will tell you basically, um, if it's too cold, bad stuff is gonna happen. It's gonna tell you to activate some of the character's spirit abilities, which are pretty much always bad. And then the card is gonna tell you if your characters get to heal, if they have bandages, and if your characters uh, get better, if you've got medicine on them. Uh, I know it seems complicated, but here we go. Okay, so let's draw a fate card first. Let's see what, what we get. So we get this one here. Now, forget about this here. This is used only in certain combat situations, but when you draw a fate card at this stage of the game, you just always forget what's down there. So let's read it from the top here. It says, raise the illness of all ill characters who did not take any meds or herbal meds by one. All right, so if we had somebody who was sick and on whom we would not have put any, you know, medication, they would, get more ill. All right, fine. Then you discard herbal meds tokens from all characters. So that's why I was saying there's no use putting meds or bandages or herbal meds on a character that is not sick because the game would have you remove the token. So if you put a token on someone and they're not gonna use it and then it gets removed, you've just wasted a, to a token. So never put anything on a character that is not you know, ill or wounded. Now you see, this card could have also said something different. Like let's draw, okay, another one here, like one of the good ones. All right, let's pretend we uh, drew this one here, okay? It says, raise the wounds of all wounded unbandaged characters by one. See, this would have been really bad for us because Emilia is wounded and she doesn't have a bandage. So then her wounds would go from two, which she is right now, up to three, which is bad. So this would have been horrible, okay? Then it says, lower the illness of all characters who took meds by one. So if we had somebody who was sick and we had put this on them, then you draw this card and they get better and you remove this token. So as I said, the game through the fate cards will decide if your characters get better, if they get ill, you know? So this is a very, very, very tricky thing. You have to, you, you can't really plan for it. So as I said, I'm not, I'm not enamored with it. All right, so let's keep reading here. So it says, if cold tokens minus board ups 
equals four or more, raise the illness of three chosen characters by one. So if it's too cold in the house, people get ill. Now we only have one cold token up there and we have no board ups, okay? Board ups are things that you can build to cover up holes in the house and board ups are extremely useful because, well, not only do they, you know, kind of stop the cold from getting in, but they also help you in the night raids phase. We'll get to that when we get to that, but basically they kind of stop people from coming in a little bit, okay? Next it says exchange the nearest location. So out of the three locations down there, we'll have to get rid of one and draw another one. We'll get to that in a bit. Then it says resolve, resolve all weight tokens. Weight tokens are basically, um, let's say we can build something called a rainwater collector, okay? And you build it and you put a weight token on it. And it doesn't do anything until you get to resolve weight tokens. So then you take the weight token off, you would resolve the card, the rainwater collector would get some water, and then that's it. So yeah, this is printed on every one of these fate cards and weight tokens are only resolved at that stage of the game. Next it says resolve spirit A on all character cards. And as we've talked about during setup, spirit A is what's gonna happen the most. All right, so let's see what all of these spirit A do. That was bad English. And then we'll decide in which order to activate them. All right, so here, pretty easy, no effect, fine. Here it says habit, discard one coffee from the storage, which we do not have, or raise Amelia, <laughs> Amelia's misery by one. So she's gonna get miserable because she's not drinking her coffee. Um, by the way, you need to know that when a character is sleeping, let's say we would have had a character sleep throughout the whole night, they are still considered to be sleeping during this whole spirit situation. So you would not activate their spirit if they are currently asleep, all right? That's very important to, to note because people forget about that. All right, so we're gonna have to raise our misery by one. And then here, same thing with him, uh, Marin here, discard one coffee from the storage or raise his misery by one, so that's gonna happen. And then here, if there is at least one book in the storage, lower Anton's misery by one. Oh, you know what, guys? We actually did find a book. All right, so this is not even a, a choice. Like, we have to do this. It says, if there is at least one book in the storage, there is lower Anton's misery by one and raises fatigue <laughs> by one. Okay, so, okay, so we'll remove the misery. We'll raise his fatigue and we'll discard this book. Let's do him next. So we do not have coffee. So this guy's gonna get miserable. And so is she. But now, uh, see it says at the beginning of the dawn phase, uh, that's gonna be next turn. Okay, so on the next turn in the dawn phase, uh, we can have Amelia raise her fatigue to lower her misery by the same amount. So yeah, we might do that next round. Okay, so I mean, all in all, I mean, we got some pretty miserable people. <laughs> But uh, it could be worse. Yeah, it could always be worse. Now, I'm not gonna get through this, but the rules also say that like, if somebody died this round, you know, you have to like raise their misery and all that, but let's not even go th through that right now because nobody died, thankfully. And then next what we get to do is go to the side of the board here and draw two narrative actions and keep one. Now, these are fun. These are like good things that you can use. Um, I think most of them are like one-time use things, okay? But they're all, I guess, useful. So here's the first one here. It says secret storage. Play at the beginning of the night raid phase. Place any three tokens or resources from the storage on this card. They are ignored when the night raid damage is resolved. Okay, so basically before somebody comes in to steal your stuff, you hide it away. So that's good. We might use that. Let's just put it here for now. And the next one here is going to be vigilant watch. Play during the night raid phase again, okay. Lower the damage wounds from a single night raid card by four tokens, resources, or wounds. <laughs> okay, this you guys are like, what? Wait, what's all these words? Because when somebody bad comes in, okay, let's actually look at a night raids card right now. This is what your average night raids card looks like, okay? When somebody comes in, they will deal four damage, and by damage they mean that they will steal any four tokens or resources, in this case, starting with green. And then they will deal your character one wound, okay? So this card here says that we can lower the damage or wounds from a single night raids by four tokens, resources, or wounds. So essentially we could like use this to block this whole thing and then our character will get one damage. Or we could block this and three of this. So we would like block this wound, we would block three of the damage and then they, they would just take one token. So this is pretty good. This is like a kind of a shield situation. Um, yeah, 
Um, I think... I think I like this better, okay? This helps us to hide stuff. You could say that this kind of does the same thing, but this can actually stop wounds, which is very good. Like, if they steal our stuff, fine. Well, not fine, but I mean, just getting wounded is so bad, because if you, as you've seen, if you're wounded and you want to get healthy again, well, A, you need to find bandages, put them on there, and two, you need to draw the right fate card for your bandages to, like, activate, okay? So getting wounded and getting ill is bad. So I'm gonna keep that one and discard this one. So that's it. So we'll uh, discard this fate card. We might draw it again. It's gonna go back in the deck. I've put the Vigilant Watch here with our stuff. And after discarding the fate card, let's not forget, the fate card told us to exchange the nearest location. So let's do that. All right, so the locations here go from close to far. So you see, if you're closer to home, you get more time to search, and if you're further away, you get less time. So exchange the nearest location. So act this actually goes away. So all of this will go back in the box. This card will go out of the game, so we won't draw this again. Then you would slide everything down here so that the far space is uh, free, and then you just draw a new location. Oh yes, the city hospital. Yeah, you guys, if you're lucky enough to get the city hospital, uh, you're gonna thank me. This place is pretty cool because you can trade. You return six exploration cards to trade. That's super expensive. But uh, you can also return four exploration cards to heal, which is uh, pretty good because Emilia is wounded, so we might go there next turn. But anyway, so that was that. And then at the end of all this, the Dawn phase is complete, and there's a little bit of flavor text here, and we're gonna be showing this for the last time. It says, let us look back on the past day. How did we do? What will we need next? What must be scavenged or traded? What should we build? And let's see what tomorrow will bring us. Start a new day, see the morning phase. There you go. So, we have just completed our first round. Now, I know this first round has been pretty long, but, you know, we're uh, I'm teaching it as we're playing it. The next rounds should go by a little bit faster. All right, so let's move on to the second round. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the like button down below. Now, I know it seems like a very small thing to do, but it actually does help the channel when you do that. And if ever you should find yourself in a super generous mood, well, I do accept donations via PayPal. And anything you give, big or small, will help keep me going. Sarajevo is synonymous with snipers. Is this where the 200 uh, people have been killed? Yes. 